Hey guys, welcome to another episode of NetSec Now. Today we're going to discuss getting into the meat and potatoes of network security auditing. We're going to discuss all the phases in depth of a security audit, uh, whether it be vulnerability scanning, um, you know, penetration testing, uh, internal audits, external audits, you name it, we're going to get into it guys and we're going to discuss some of the tools we're going to be using inside of Kali Linux. So moving on, uh, let's come up with a disclaimer. Any information disclosed in this series is provided for the sole purpose of learning network security. We take no responsibility for any misuse of any information we provide. We only suggest you audit the systems you have permission on or in your virtual lab. So in short, please don't be an idiot. Moving along, let's get into it. Phases of penetration testing, internal and external. Okay, so a lot of people seem to have a misconception of what the that the process or the flow should actually be for a penetration test or a network security audit. Well, that's what we're going to get into. So the very first step uh, is information gathering. And, and this applies basically on the internal auditing and the external auditing levels. So information gathering is doing your homework, essentially getting all of the information that you possibly can up front before you even begin anything. So you want to take notes, write things down, you don't want to try to keep mental notes because, you know, it may mess you up. You may forget some things down the line when you need them. There are some tools out there uh, in Kali Linux to work with that. You know, some of them are free. Some of them community versions are very limited and you can't use them professionally uh, according to their license agreements, things like that. But uh, really all you need to do is open a notepad, guys, and type away or keep a pad and pen by the desk by, like I do and uh, write some notes down as you're going. So the next step then is reconnaissance. So you got to build a case. You have to take all of the information that you gathered and you have to build a case for the best starting point uh, of analysis or the best starting point of uh, penetration testing, so on and so forth. So you have to take all that information and really plot your course like anybody would do, a pilot or a ship's captain or something like that. You got to plot your course of the best way to take action. So moving forward from that, you actually get into the access or the exploitation. And I say bombs away because it's it's pretty much how it goes. So you, you've gathered all your information, you did your homework, you built a case, you have an avenue to start traveling down first uh, in order to attack the network successfully. Um, so basically at that point you got to find the exploits that exist for that service or vulnerability or whatever you found uh, in building your case and doing your homework, and then you got to fire it off. Um, sometimes you may come up with false positives where it says that there's a vulnerability for a service but they may have had a patched version installed so while the version of software like an FTP server or a uh, web server or something like that says the specific version matches up with the vulnerability that's in the database there might be a patch applied so don't be surprised if you run into some roadblocks from time to time where you'll find that uh, you, you, know, you fire one off and it's supposed to match up and it doesn't work all that means is you'll have to go back to your notes and take a different route. So then after you ex you know exploit the network and you're in, you got to do your post exploitation exercises. So now that you gain access to any system, one system, 10 systems, all the systems on the network, whatever it is, you have to figure out what you're going to do next. See, doing your homework and getting into a system, you know, it's two of the steps, but what are you going to do to leverage that system to gather intelligence about the other, you know, systems on the network? So you have to set up things like pivoting and, uh, you know, you can do like man in the middle attacks. And I mean, there's all sorts of good stuff. You could do ARP spoofing with the man in the middle attacks. There's all sorts of good stuff. And we'll get into all of that, guys, in, in the uh, videos to follow this. So after that, um, you're basically down to your reporting function. So what you do is you take all of your results, not only in your information gathering, your reconnaissance, and your access exploitation, and your post exploitation, and you build a report. Now, again, there's some tools in Kali Linux that will help you build your reports. Um, you know, there's no one way to do it uh, on the free software, the open source source software uh, that we'll be using, unfortunately. Um, you know, there's some paid versions of software that, uh, you know, have some fancy reporting capabilities. Uh, you know, OpenVos is free and it does have a pretty good HTML reporting facility inside of it, uh, as we've shown in the other videos. Um, Nmap, you can export it to an XML and use a converter to convert that into an HTML file. 
Um, you know, Armitage and Metasploit is really limited. Um, you know, the same creator that created Armitage, he came up with uh, Cobalt Strike, which is a paid version. And I was wrong in one of the other videos. I think I said it was $1,500 a year. I believe it's either $25 or $3,500 per year. It's relatively expensive. But anyway, so you're going to be able to report. Uh, what I recommend is using OpenOffice. I mean, OpenOffice is great. That's what I use to create these slides, even inside of Windows. And you can use that inside of Linux. I mean, that's in fact where it came from was the Linux world. Um, and you can build PDFs in there. You can build uh, presentations like this one here. Um, you know, you can build uh, HTML stuff. I mean, there's a bunch of different things you can do. And it's like it's like Office for Windows, but it's open source. Um, so once you build a report, you have to sit down with, if you're doing it for a large company, you may have to sit down with multiple people uh, of the higher ups, the higher level ups. You know, small or medium sized companies, you maybe just have to sit down with the IT administrator and the business owner uh, and discuss what you found. Um, so in your report should be not only how you found it, what you found, uh, how you gained access to it, and then what the fixes are for it. So you'd be listing like the CVEs or the you know vulnerabilities that you found for it, uh, links and references to that, and the links and references to fixing it and patching it if such is available. So then after that, once you once you're done and you present them with that report, you have two options. For an extra fee, you could you know help them uh, fix their issues. Or, um, you know, basically let them go on their own and call you back to schedule a, a re-audit, if you will. Uh, and that's, that's really what you're going to be doing is basically holding your hand and you should be re-auditing the network once you're done and once they've said they've implemented all of your uh, fixes and just to make sure that they're, you know, now secure. So moving on, as we said, there's different types of audits. There's an external audit, which is outside of the local area network at your customer's location. There's an internal audit, which is inside of the local network. Uh, a lot of this you'll find like the PCI compliances and stuff like that will require an internal and external. Um, and getting down to the different types of testing you'll be doing is a vulnerability assessment and you'll just be checking for vulnerabilities against services, software, things like that. And then there's another type of test which you'll be doing is penetration testing. Now penetration testing is testing from the outside world in as well as on the internal side trying to leverage one of the local machines or being local on a network to launch attacks against internal services. Um, you know, we'll get into the different types of attacks here in just a minute. Uh, also you'll be doing security policy auditing. Security policy auditing um, is really just whatever security policy they may have in place. Now most places do not have a security policy in place. Um, things like, you know, employees violating the terms of service uh, for using the company computers like, you know, for things like surfing Facebook or, you know, eBaying or YouTubing or something. Um, you know, you'll have to review that security policy and maybe create one for them. So in the information gathering, here's what we want to do. What we want to find out is who is our client? Well, you know, who are they? What, what business are they in? Uh, things like that you want to find out what they do essentially not only just their business name but you want to try to gather as much information as possible um, including you know what information have they or do they make public you know check their website I mean you'll be surprised at a lot of companies what they put on their website they'll put an email list of you know all the contacts inside of the company which makes it really easy to do social engineering at that point right um, you know they'll, they'll list stuff like their address um, telephone numbers fax lines, things like that. All things that you should be writing down and keeping track of. You want to find out who their ISP is. Now, <laughs> I've had some customers that will not even give me their public IP address. They say, well, if you're a penetration tester, you should be able to figure that out on your own. So therefore, you have to use different techniques, and we'll get into that on how to actually obtain that, uh, that information, IP address, so on and so forth. Um, so you want to know what their ISP is, basically. Um, you know, if you don't know their IP address, take a look at some of the major providers around in that area. Do a Google search, and I'm sure you'll come up with uh, a couple of them. Uh, what type of business are they in? Are they an importer-exporter? Are they a manufacturing company? Are they uh, a stock company that you know sells you know on the stock market? Are they uh, otherwise another financial investment type um, company? Are they you know a small bank? Are they a school? Are they? I mean the the possibilities are endless. You want to find out what they're into. And the reason why you want to find out what type of business they're in 
is because you'll better be able to, to gauge and get better knowledge based upon maybe what type of proprietary software they may use. For instance, manufacturing uh, plants may use a certain type of software. And the reason why you want to find that out is you go to that company's website and you find out that it only runs on Windows 2000. So right ahead, right off the bat, you know that if they're using that software, they're definitely likely using it on Windows 2000 or older. So there's different ways to engineer you know, your information to suit your scanning techniques. Also, you want to find out who works there. Present, former employees. Um, a lot of times you'll find that disgruntled employees will make uh, posts online on places like Glassdoor.com and uh, Yahoo.com and stuff like that, really, you know, uh, putting out the dirt on the, of the company they used to work for. You know, like, ah, you know, we work there and uh, all their Windows XP systems used to keep crashing and, you know, whatever. And it was horrible and their server would crash every day. And, you know, they started blocking Facebook. And, you know, you'll be surprised, guys. It's, uh, it's actually pretty funny to see what some of these people have to say. But you can use that in your information and intel gathering techniques to build a case against your best avenue of attack. You may be able to leverage some of those past employees by sending them a you know, letter if it's a large multinational company or a chain or something like that. Oh yeah, you know, and you get social engineering. You know, I, I worked at the, you know, store 2764, and uh, you know, oh they were horrible, man. I hear you. I know where you're coming from. You know, and then you can get them to tell you more information about the internal network. See, so uh, social engineering plays plays a very big role in network security and auditing, and we'll get into that too. Um, so also, you want to know how many people do they employ. And it may be hard to judge unless you come directly out and ask them. Uh, it may be hard to, to judge how many people actually work there. So again, you go back to their website, you see, is there any extensions, you know, for certain users like Mary's at extension 101, Bob's at extension 102, Jim's at extension 103, so on and so forth. You'll get a pretty good, you know, average gauge of how many people actually work there. And that'll help you to build your case to work on how many computers you're looking at. You know, what, what type of network setup are you looking at? I mean, if there's three people that work at a corporation, the likelihood of them having a, you know, Windows small business server is probably slim to none. So you're going to be looking at, you know, just a small work group type of network. Whereas if they had, you know, 20 employees or 30, 50, 100, you know, you may, make, may be looking at multiple domain controllers or Windows servers, you know, on that network. So these are all things that you really need to learn in your information gathering process in order to better base your attack. So some of the tools you're going to be using, as I said, is logic, your brain. That's the best, most intuitive tool that you will use in your entire career, I promise you. Um, computers can only do so much. Computers do what we tell them to do. When we do a Google search, we're telling them to Google search, you know, something. Um, you have to be able to use your brain. and. That's why information gathering is such a, a critical component of network security auditing and, you know, systems penetration testing. Um, again, with using your brain, you can go to Google and do something that's cool called Google dorking, and we'll briefly touch on that. I don't use it too, too much because that's really, it used to be big back in the day, but nowadays, I mean, it's pretty easy to, uh, you know, just browse somebody's website, and I mean, you'll be surprised, you know, social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, LinkedIn.com, these people put out all this crazy information, so there's no, you know, really hiding themselves anymore. Everybody's so happy to give out all their information. Um, but Google dorking essentially is, you know, specialized uh, Google search. It's like in URL, and then you're searching for, you know, passwords.txt or something, you know, and you put in their URL and that. I mean, there's a bunch of different things. You can read more about it online. I'm sure you can find some resources that'll, you know, maybe be able to explain it better than I would. Um, Again, social media sites, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Yahoo groups, Google groups, you'd be surprised at how much these people put out there. I mean, you know, you can pretty much guess anything about them at that point, which might help you down the line if you are able to, you know, see that they're posting on XYZ forum about, you know, some favorite car they like and, you know, Jim Harris from uh, XYZ Corporation is posting on there about his 98 Porsche and how much he loves his 98 Porsche. Well, you could probably guess that he's really into cars and Porsches in particular, so maybe try some password attacks, combinations, secret, uh, you know, uh, security questions that have to do with, you know, what was your first car? Maybe he would put Porsche. You see what I mean? You have to use your brain. So, also, like I said, check out their website. Um, their websites, 
corporate websites will be a plethora of information for you to build your case. Um, like I said, things from email addresses, uh, extensions, um, you know, phone extensions, uh, you know, other, other stuff inside like contact forms, um, you know, their address, their telephone numbers. I mean, you want everything, guys. There are certain tools in Kali Linux that like are web scrapers that will go out and pull down, you know, certain search terms from their website. Um, but really, you can just poke around manually, spend five or ten minutes, and you'll get a better look or a better view than any pre-built scanner would, because you know you know what you're looking for. The scanner kind of is just roundabout, knowing what you're looking for. It's not it's not going to gain as much knowledge as you will if you physically went to the site. I fully believe in doing things as manually as possible when it comes to information gathering, only because your logic is is way better than any tool. Um, also, do a Whois lookup on their domain name. Right, so if they have uh, acmeinc.com, just do a Whois search on the domain. You can do that right in Kali Linux, right in the terminal, or you can do it via, you know, another web page like a lookup or something like that. Um, see who it's registered to. You know, when you find out who it's registered to, maybe it's the technical contact, and they might even have a technical support contact email address in there. They might have a telephone number and a direct extension. There's all sorts of information. Name servers that come up if they're hosting on a, uh, you know, public uh, server like. GoDaddy or something like that, you could do a dig on the DNS servers maybe and come up with some other sites. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. So, again, do that Whois lookup, take notes, move forward. Um, as I said, there's some tools in Kali Linux that aid in this. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, a lot of them are open source, but they're the quote unquote community versions, um, which are very limited in use and you're not supposed to use them professionally. Um, their pro versions are astronomically priced and you know, if you're just starting out, which this series is geared towards, uh, if you're just starting out, you're probably not going to have the capital to buy all of these very, very, very expensive yearly costing tools. Um, so I'm going to try to teach you how to do it the old school way and do it the manual way for the most part. So again, I, I can't stress this enough, guys. Use logic. Definitely use logic. Social engineering will come into play. Like I said, if you go find past employees that are disgruntled, um, you know, if you can clone an email address, you know, spoof an email address and send out some emails, you know, maybe with a payload in it, <laughs> maybe with a uh, something from the social engineering toolkit like a, a fake website, like a Facebook login or, you know, a LinkedIn profile or something like that where they have to put in their username and password. I mean, you know, possibilities are kind of endless. Um, the social engineering aspect is really going to help you out uh, in the long run. And we'll get to that and we'll get to different types of social engineering uh, coming up. So the next step here is reconnaissance. Um, roll up your sleeves, it's time to get dirty. First of all, you have to stay quiet. You don't want to make too much noise on the network. You don't want to let network administrators know what you're up to, especially if they're not privy to you scanning their network and you're hired by the, the higher-ups or the upper levels. So there's different things you could do. Um, you know, in some of our videos, we talked about spoofing your IP. Uh, in some of the advanced videos after this subseries, we will get to uh, using Nmap better to, um, you know, thwart uh, firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, and all that good stuff. Um, you want to do port scanning. Um, Nmap, we've we've mentioned briefly in some other videos. Um, not only are you going to find the ports, but you're going to find the services. You can do OS fingerprinting to find out what kind of operating systems and service packs you're up against. Uh, it'll find MAC addresses if it's possible. Um, there's a plethora of information that Nmap will show you, and we'll get into these tools as we go through uh, the, the videos and actually doing this stuff and performing it. Um, so service discovery and identification is basically what's going to come out of port scanning. However, you have to know that some services are spoofable to their source port. So meaning like on one of my Unix machines, let's say for instance, SSH normally runs on port 22, but if I put it on port 6022, if you're only scanning 1 through 1024 on the ports, you're never going to know that SSH exists. Now, SSH is a dead giveaway that it's a Unix or a Linux machine, right? Uh, same thing with FTP services. You know, same thing with uh, websites. Uh, same thing with email logins. I mean, you know, a lot of different ports are for different things. So um, I suggest that you do some manual uh, service discoveries, and we'll get into that as well. But you want to make sure you have a... a pretty clearly stated identified list, uh, very clear cut list of, you know, this port 22 is open, it says it's SSH, I telnet it into it, I grab the banner, 
and it says it's definitely SSH. So you know it's not being spoofed, right? Some of these port scanners will just go by the port number and guess what service is running on the port. So you want to make sure. Uh, social engineering phase one, like I said, um, dig around on social media websites, you know, maybe shoot off an email or a phone call to, uh, you know, their help desk or something like that. Um, we're going to get into vulnerability scanning. Um, we've showed you in the videos before about using OpenVOS uh, and setting that up and, you know, doing a basic scan. You're going to want to scan for vulnerabilities. Now, there's two ways to do this. You can use OpenVOS as a standalone just to see if there's any vulnerabilities available. If you're only doing a vulnerability assessment, you can use that. However, Armitage has built into it, obviously, uh, to check the host against its operating system ports and services that are attached to those ports, uh, open and maybe available vulnerabilities for those specific ports and services and OSs. Um, so there's two ways you can do it to double fact check yourself. You could use OpenVOS and then use Armitage with Metasploit and, and do it the same way. Verification. So again, using logic, you have to check, 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 and check again. As I said, when you're checking ports, port 22 says it's SSH in like Nmap or some other port scanner, you want to tell that into that baby and you want to grab the banner. It's called manual banner grabbing. That's a trick that we used to do way, way, way back in the day before port scanners were even like really popular and able to guess things so accurately. Tell that into the port, make sure it's running SSH or whatever the port is, 21 FTP server, make sure it's running that version of software. Now, once you have all of your things, you want to put it all together and build that case, as we spoke about in the beginning of the tutorial. Once you build your case, now you're going to have a clear-cut path of where you're going next, right? So let's get into that. Some of the tools of the trade that you're going to be using, again, logical thinking, planning is key. Uh, you definitely have to have all of your ducks in a row if you want to successfully audit or, or pen test a network. Um, for port scanning, we're going to be using things like Nmap, HPing3, Netcat, which we actually had a request for a Netcat tutorial the other day, so I'm glad that that's already included in here. Um, you know, there's other things you can use, like I said, you know, Telnet and stuff like that. Uh, vulnerability scanners, OpenVOS uh, is free, of course. Nessus, there's a community version, and then there's a paid version. The community version really isn't great. Um, the paid version is there, but it's very expensive. Uh, Metasploit and Armitage. Now, those are both free. Um, the Metasploit framework and the Armitage as the front end is both free. Um, then the same guy, like I said earlier, who wrote Armitage, he went out and made Cobalt Strike, which is kind of an upgraded version of Armitage with reporting features and social engineering tools built into it. Um, but, you know, i got to say one thing quickly. A lot of people have taken what social engineering was out of context. Social engineering used to be, and if you've heard anything about Kevin Mitnick um, was what he used to gain access to all the telco companies and all these other big companies was just simply calling somebody on the phone pretending like he was somebody who he wasn't and getting them to give up information it's a fact people are stupid and people like to give up information just take a look at Facebook take a look at you know LinkedIn take a look at I mean these people will give you everything maybe even their social security number but everything short of their social security number um, so you you want to keep out uh, looking up for that. Uh, there's website scanners um, that we'll be using, um, you know, like WebScarab, things like that. We'll get into a couple of them. I really don't use web scanners per se unless I'm actually desperate and I'm looking for an exploit inside of you know web code, uh, web applications like PHP, um, ASP, you know, stuff like that. SQL injections, cross-site scripting. I'm not really you know a big fan of, but um, sometimes if I know for sure, like, I can't get any other way, my last ditch effort is to try to scan, you know, web apps, uh, their websites and stuff like that. So, um, as I said, you know, you want to use Telnet and banner grabbing for verification. I just went into that, you know, it's all about checking what the port scanner is saying that is running on those ports or listening on those ports. It's all about manually checking and just making sure that that port scanner is on, on key. Um, RC and port checking, again, same kind of thing as Telnet, banner grabbing, but... There may be some services that don't give up their, you know, their their version number or even what they are, you know, especially in the higher level ports, anything outside of uh, one through 1024. Um, so you might want to go out and check out, you know, what what does this port belong to? And people have posted online. There's RFCs about different protocols that you know 
are not proprietary but belong on specific ports or changeable to certain ports, um, you know, like IRC, stuff like that. So you want to check that out. You know, case file software or notepad, whatever, like I said, it's all about taking notes. I mean, I, I still keep a pen and pad next to the desk here, even though I can fire up notepad or, or uh, you know, Word or something like that and, you know, fire some information there. But sometimes I'm on the fly, I'm on the move, I, I just want to do it fast. I write it down, I take quick notes on notepad, and I am good to go. Now I always have something to reference it back. I don't have to worry about accidentally losing a file, deleting it, not saving it, so on and so forth. So moving on, we want to get into the access exploitation phase. Now there's different types of attacks. There's a remote attack, a client side attack, a blind side attack, social engineering attack, fuzzing attack with a, a DOS or denial of service, and man in the mill attacks. Now, a remote attack is when you're outside of the network and you're trying to exploit um, remote services. What you're trying to do is you know just find vulnerabilities inside of those services, open ports. Uh, client side attack is more of where you already have access to it. Um, or using social engineering like the social engineering toolkit and you send them a payload and you know or a false page they click on it they enter in their username and password and oops it was false and then sent it back to you um, that's like a client side attack a blind side attack is pretty much just launching everything in your arsenal against a network when all else fails at that point you don't really care about being noisy you just you just want to make sure that there's absolutely no way in so you just launch it all uh, I don't recommend doing that very often by the way I mean it's very noisy and uh, you know can cause things to crash um, the social engineering attack, you know, I mean, really, the social engineering attack, you know, you can use things like SE Toolkit, like I said, to, uh, you know, spoof websites, um, you know, send uh, links to people in an email, you know, spoof your email address, get them to log into, like, their Facebook or LinkedIn page or something, or, you know, heck, even click a link that's disguised as a LinkedIn link, and, you know, bingo, it opens up a Java exploit and, you know, creates a reverse shell back to your box and you're in. Um, or you could call somebody on the phone like they used to do back in the day. Um, call somebody on the phone, pretend like you're somebody who you're not, and get them to trust you enough to either tell you your password or give you their email address so you can send them a certain file that their boss needs to have on his desk by, you know, whatever time, and you can't get through to his email because it's busy. Could you please forward it over to him? And as soon as she gets it, she forwards it over to the boss. Now it comes from her, and it looks legit. The boss clicks it, you're in. Fuzzing uh, attack and DDoS attack or DOS attack. That's useful if you know you're trying to do maybe some firewall IDS IPS evasions. Uh, you know they've they got a very strict policy in place. What you're basically trying to do is you're basically trying to confuse the firewall or get it busy doing other tasks like handling attacks while you try to sneak in around the other side of that uh, and uh, you know get past their their filters. Um, you know there's different types of tools for that. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, there's also man in the middle attacks. Now, the thing with man in the middle attacks is they're pretty simple to perform. Um, once you're in a network, you can, or in between a network and a link, you know, like Google, for instance, or their ISP or whatever, you can do ARP spoofing and you can capture all their packets that they're sending out. So if they're checking emails, they're um, FTPing their you know, going to Facebook, they're going to a forum, they're going to a company website, a vendor's website, something like that, you can capture not only the website traffic, uh, the HTTP headers, the source IP address, the destination IP address, but you can also capture usernames and passwords, even on SSL, which is important to know because there's things like SSL strip and stuff like that that is inside of um, Kali that will allow you to get around the whole SSL encryption thing. So moving on, some of the tools of the trade we're going to be using, as we said, uh, Metasploit plus Armitage. Um, you know, but that's not your end-all, be-all of exploitations. While it's good to keep it frequently updated, there may be somebody that's not releasing it publicly, and but they found an exploit, they wrote it in C, they wrote it in C code, and they're just released it on their own personal website. So, you know, maybe you do a crafty Google search and you'll find that code, read it over, make sure it's not bad for your system, download it, compile it, and fire it. Um, there's not too many of those scripts that exist nowadays, publicly anyway. Uh, so we may not be able to do an example. Maybe I'll write a quick Hello World script in C. I'm not really a good programmer in C, so um, maybe I'll find an example or something and copy and paste it and you know get you used to how to compile it and fire it. Uh, the social engineering toolkit we'll be getting into. We will be doing um, you know crafting fake bogus login web pages that look you know with Cycloner that look like uh, legitimate pages. 
You could even do redirects on those that will redirect them again to the original page, so they'll just think that it was a login error and they got redirected again. And this this time, if they don't notice, they'll be at the original page. Cobalt Trail, like I said, there's a 21 day, I believe, 21 day free trial on uh, on his web page, which I'll put in the description. Um, but personally, I don't know if I'm going to be getting into that too much. It's kind of like Armitage, it really is. Go check it out on on, the, on his website and uh, look at some of the videos he has there. Um, and see if that's something that you want to try out for 21 days. Uh, other than that, I think, like I said, it's either 2,500 or 3,500 per user per year. A little expensive. Um, you know, Raphael's a good guy. I don't have anything against him, but I just wish that some of the reporting features were in Armitage. You know, I've even sent them an email about it, so we'll see what comes of it. Um, denial of service attacks. You know, it's it's going to be rare that you're probably going to do one against your client, unless you're testing the firewall, you're testing the IDS or the IPS. You know, just to give them a report of like, you know, hey, uh, you're susceptible to anything over 10,000 packets in X amount of seconds, then your network crashes. Um, you're probably never going to use it, though, to be honest with you guys. Uh, Google, um, you want to find vulnerability feed sites just for having the knowledge of looking up a specific CVE uh, and checking it out and see when it details and seeing what the fixes are and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe it just hasn't made it to, you know, uh, Metasploit yet. Maybe it's just out in the wild. There's various other uh, miscellaneous tools in Kali Linux that we might touch on uh, as things progress. Again guys, when you're doing network security uh, penetration testing and network security auditing, you may come across different circumstances that require different sets of tools. So it's a good idea to get familiarized with a lot of the more widely used tools than, uh, than not when you need them. Um, I make it a point to tr take a lot of notes as I'm using new software and new tools um, in, in trying to run tests against my own lab to, to get better acquainted with the tool. Um, so this way, you know, next time I need to use it, I'll have my notes with me. So let's get down to post exploitation. Access granted, now what? Well, first of all, we want to maintain hidden access. We don't want to let anybody know that we're in, right? Because then they can just quickly shut us out and kill our, you know, process or whatever. Uh, if we have like a interpreter shell on them, they could just kill off our process and, and we're done. Uh, so we'll go through maintaining access, privilege escalation, um, dumping the password hashes for both Windows and Unix, um, keeping persistent connections, migrating uh, processes from like whatever we're using with the exploit to like Notepad and then migrating that again to something that's system level if we're able to. We're going to set up pivoting. We're going to use the compromise systems to leverage other systems on the network so the attacks are further away from us as the source. So we're essentially we're going to attack one system, hold control of it, and then use that system to, to proxy basically all of our requests and attacks into the internal network or other systems and then feed back through that host back to us without anybody else knowing. Um, we're going to cover your footprints and tracks. Um, there's different ways to do that. Not only, you know, uh, leveraging your privileges and you know migrating your processes to different processes uh, system processes things like that more obscure processes um, but also we want to delete logs uh, or take a copy of the logs I mean if you're doing this for a customer chance so you're probably not going to delete the logs but you want to at least take a copy of them uh, just so you can show that you were in there and hey look this is what it is um, you want to capture evidence for proof of access so not only do you want to capture your port scans from nmap and you know, your vulnerability scans from OpenVos and, you know, stuff like that, but you want to also maybe record your screen. Uh, inside Kali Linux, there's something called Record My Desktop, and that's kind of like Camtasia is in Windows, um, you know, or uh, Cam Studio is in Windows. It's open source and free, and you can record your desktop. So if you're in there hacking away and you're busting up their systems, maybe you want to make a video of it for a presentation like, hey, look, I, uh, just rooted your entire network in eight minutes. What do you think that, you know, John Bean hacker down the road is going to be able to do? So, uh, also, again, you want to document your process of what you did. You know, I went out, I found this information here on your website. I found your company directory of email addresses and phone extensions. Then from the phone extensions, I wound up dialing certain codes, and I found out that you have a asterisk system for your voice over IP. I found out your provider is, you know, Verizon. I found out all the things you find out and then up until you actually find the vulnerabilities you want to document those then you want to document what you did to actually gain access you know fired interpreter shell so on and so forth that's why it helps to have a video of it 
just so you can go back and fix any of your written notes that you're going to write up for your report if you miss something. So tools of trade you're going to use again, Metasploit Framework plus Armitage, Cobalt Strike if you want to buy it. Uh, if you do not have the capital for it, Metasploit and Armitage will get you going and get you started. Uh, you're going to be using backdoor payloads. Some of them are inside Metasploit Framework. You can fire off with Armitage. It'll automatically compile them and put them out there for you and fire them against a the target. There are some payloads you could probably download, but we will not be touching on that because I do not want to download payloads to my machine that are not verified. Um, so you're also going to be using uh, John the Ripper and Hashcat for pass hash cracking. Um, once we, if we can, escalate privileges enough to get the hashes uh, or the encrypted password hash file for Windows and Unix systems, we download that to our machine and at our leisure we can crack those passwords. The perfect hack leaves no traces, right? So you don't want to leave a backdoor in your system that maybe might be picked up by an antivirus at some point when their definitions get updated or, um, you know, leave a backdoor there for a, a real hacker, you know, a bad guy to get in and basically use all your hard work and leverage that system now to compromise, you know, multiple other systems or do whatever. Um, so you don't want to do that. You want to crack their, their passwords if you can. Um, you know, there's word lists out there that are like 60 gigs uh, of word lists. You know, I mean, Kali Linux has some available uh, inside of it already, which we'll get to. And I'll show you how to use John, and he shows you how to use Hashcat. And if you're not sure what hashes you're working with, uh, we'll use Hash Identifier to find out or try to guess what type of hash encryption it is. Um, also, we're using ARP Spoof plus Wireshark. I'm going to show you a man in the middle attack when you're local on a network. Once you gain access to a system, maybe if you have control over other systems, instead of installing keylogger software, which can be picked up by antiviruses, firewalls, things like that, we'll use ARP Poisoning and man in the middle attacks uh, with Wireshark to capture those packets and then analyze those packets later on. Uh, once you have those packets, if you have something that was using some sort of uh, some sort of hash logarithm to encrypt passwords as they're sending it to a forum or something like that that wasn't using specifically SSL but using some sort of other like MD5 encryption or something like that, you can crack those at your own convenience, not under the gun, not under pressure, and have their usernames and passwords to put in your report. Uh, other miscellaneous tools we're going to be using, as we mentioned, HPing, uh, Netcat, we're going to be using Nmap, um, I mean, we're going to be using a lot of different things, and we're going to be using Telnet, uh, Logic, Common Sense, um, you know, you name it, all those good things, guys, we'll get into it. So reporting, what do you want to include? Well, you want to include your case file. Now, Kali Linux has a reporting type deal called case file, but again, that's kind of like can't use it for professional use, it's a community version, it's that whole nightmare of greed versus open source, uh, which we're not going to dive into because I've, I rant about that all the time. Um, you know, exporting from Armitage, it, it gives you a very crude and rudimentary uh, list of things that the commands that were fired. Um, it's essentially like recording, you know, the commands you would fire on MF, uh, MFS console. So, you know, if you wanted to put that in your report, you could. Uh, just copy and paste it. Um, exporting from Nmap into XML and then using a converter to convert it to HTML. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The reports look beautiful. You can actually edit the HTML file and put your own logo in there if you wanted to. Or you can just print it right off there to a PDF or, uh, you know, print it out on your, your physical printer. Um, Exporting from Nessus. Nessus, I believe a community version has an exporting feature. I haven't used it in a while. I can't be 100% sure. But uh, I know that their their professional version does. Uh, exporting from OpenVos, we went through that in other videos, but we will go through that again in this video. Um, you know, the PDF function is not working for whatever reason, but the HTML function is working. Um, what you want to include is a proof of access. Include a list of the fixes or the CVEs or links to the CVEs that, uh, you know, were found when leveraging those to actually exploit a system. Uh, you want to provide techniques and a little bit of help and assistance to avoid further access. Um, you know, like, hey, you know, install this patch from Microsoft or, hey, you know, install the newest Adobe Reader or something like that. Um, provide proof that you no longer have an active access to the system. This is important because if you do not show this and they get attacked, by somebody else, even if you've cleaned up all of your exploits and vulnerabilities that you use to leverage and get into that system, if they get attacked by another hacker, a black hat hacker or whatever, 
and their system gets compromised, who's the first person they're going to turn around and point at? You. Because you were the last one to leverage your system. You provided them with a report saying, hey, I was in your system, and hey, I rooted your you know, Windows domain controller, and hey, I cracked all your usernames and passwords. Well, if somebody else does that, they're going to blame you. Hey, well, you must have left something open, a back door in there or something. So you're going to... This is where the Armitage reporting feature comes in handy, or the exporting feature, I should say. Um, it could show that you closed down the session, the interpreter session, or the shell session, or something like that. It can show that you closed that down, and you deleted it from the database, so it releases you of liability. But also, when guys, in your contracts, your contracts are very important. Make sure you stipulate the terms of your contract very well. Have a lawyer do it for you. It will pay off in the long run. I'm not kidding. Any excuse a client will use, especially if you're doing PCI compliancy or something like that that has to do with credit cards, uh, any kind of HIPAA stuff with social security numbers, doctor's offices, hospitals, things like that, you will want a stipulation in your contract saying that you are not liable for this, you are liable for that, so on and so forth. You will want it outlined professionally by a lawyer so there is no loophole, there is no mistake. And if there is a mistake, you have the lawyer to blame, not you. You're also going to need insurance too, guys. Um, that's something that we might touch on too. A uh, little bit of E&O, which is an errors and emissions policy. If you're going to be doing this professionally, you're going to be working for yourself, you will need errors and emissions policies. Um, that basically says that if anything goes wrong and it hits the fan and they do find a way to sue you, at least you have insurance to cover your losses uh, so you will not go broke. <laughs> okay, so... Moving on, finishing up final tasks, uh, presenting the fancy report and analysis. This is key. You have to really blow them out of their seats with the report that, in you know, presentation that you present them with, you know, the information, the facts, the findings, and you know what you've done, um, because you want their future business. I mean, that's what it is. You, you or if you're working for a company, you want to stay relative. Uh, offer assistance in patching, training, policy management, etc. for an extra fee. If you are doing this as a contractor, always charge an extra fee for that. Do not get them to rope you in for fixing their issues for free because most companies will try to. Make sure that's also stipulated in your contracts if you're going to uh, be doing this for yourself as a contractor. Make sure that is stipulated in your contract that any work outside of the scope is for an extra fee. You do not want to be working for free. Trust me when I tell you because once they get you, they will keep getting you for that and you will find yourself being trapped. Uh, final assessment of the network. Um, once all the training and the policy management, etc., the patching has taken place, all that good stuff, you want to do a post follow up audit to make sure that everything has been patched correctly. At that point, you want to generate another quick report. You don't have to go into detail, but a quick report saying, okay, you've addressed this, 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 and this, include it with the original report, check it off, make them sign off on it, you keep a copy for yourself that they signed off on and you signed off on and they keep a copy. Um, encrypt your reports and findings. If you're going to hold on to them guys, if this is going to be like a contracted gig at a company where you know quarterly or bi-yearly or yearly you're going to be doing an audit for them and you want to keep those files, keep them encrypted. Uh, Kali Linux comes with TrueCrypt so any kind of scan results, you know whatever you can stick it on a volume and encrypt it and you won't have to worry about if somebody somehow steals your system physically or you know, breaks into your system virtually, they're not going to get your customer's information and go and break into their networks or try to anyway. Uh, and then finally, at the end of it, guys, let's move on to the next audit. Uh, close that one up, encrypt it, you know, or securely erase it from your hard drive and move on. Um, you know, you're not going to be, it's not, it's not a nine to five everyday job. Um, it's just not, it's not like regular IT support. IT support's like a nine to five gig and even if you're a contractor, you're only open from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and after that, you don't care, you don't want to hear about anything. A lot of times, you'll find yourself being doing audits at night because the network's quieter. Um, you know, you don't, if, if something happens, you don't want to disrupt their, you know, their business traffic, you know, for, for, and disrupt their business process throughout the day. So you may be working a lot of nights, uh, weekends. Um, you know, if you do it, uh, emergency system response, which I do, um, you know, going in there and, and mitigating after an attack. Uh, you know, you might be doing some, you know, investigative work as to how the attack happened, why it happened, what did they get. Uh, so you want to, you know, securely virtualize that machine and you want to go through it with forensic software and find out exactly where and how and why and what. Uh, and then you want to report that to your customer and they will take care of what they have to take care of on any insurance sides or government agencies that they may need to contact. And they may need your help as well to explain it to, you know, the FBI or whoever, um, you know, if they get compromised. 
so that's pretty much it guys. Um, in the next set of videos we're going to be getting into actually using these tools. I'm actually going to go through the process in Kali Linux. Now I have set up a virtual lab here as you've been probably seeing by following the blog and Facebook. Um, I have a virtual lab going on. We have a Windows 2003, uh, Server 2003 standard edition domain controller in there handling DNS, uh, Active Directory, and some other little nice things that I put in there for you guys. Um, we have a Windows XP, uh, XP Service Pack 3 with Windows updates turned off um, on there joined to the domain. Uh, we have, and that's specially configured as well, so a couple of common misconceptions or misconfigurations in a corporate network that a lot of admins do and overlook. Uh, we have a Windows 7 Ultimate machine joined to the network as well. There's a lot of networks that you'll find that have mixed clients in there. Some are Windows XP, some are, you know, Vista, some are Windows 7. Now with Windows 8 being out, there might be some Windows 8, Windows 8 things in there, but it really hasn't made it to the enterprise yet. Um, you might even see some legacy you know, systems like Windows 2000 and Windows 98 for, you know, a special type of software that you would have found out if you were doing your information gathering, right? That only runs on Windows 98 SE or Windows 2000, right? So, um, you will find some mixed networks from time to time. Uh, so we have that going on. We also have a Unix or Linux system, um, Metasploitable it's called. You can download it uh, if you do a Google search, and I'll put a link in the description as well. Metasploitable is a customized um, VMware image uh, that, that's been configured to, by default, have various different web exploits, server exploits, version exploits, remote client, remote attacks, client attacks. I mean, it's full of, it's full of uh, silliness. <laughs> so you can get in there and hack right away at it. Um, so we have that all in the network. We're trying to simulate uh, a network as best as possible here. I am missing some resources. I am missing Windows Server 2008. However, at the very core of how everything works in the back end of an Active Directory domain uh, system or network, Windows 2003 Server will serve just fine for our purposes. Um, there's not a whole lot of core differences between Windows 2003 Server and Windows 2008 Server. This really isn't. Um, and that's that's pretty much it, guys. So. Uh, stay tuned for the next videos. Uh, one other thing I just want to say is uh, I hope you guys have been to check out our website. Uh, we got away from Blogspot, Google, and all that. I uh, went ahead and bought a real domain name and set it up for you guys so we could have more control over the website and how it looks and how it you know pans out and things that we can do with it. Uh, that is LearnNetSec.com. Check it out. Sign up for a free account so you can uh, make comments and... Uh, you know, get into some areas that we're going to be setting up soon that uh, are going to be private to members only. Um, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Uh, definitely like our videos, share them up, post them on Twitter. Check us out on Twitter at LearnNetSec. And that's pretty much it, guys. See you in the next video. Thanks for watching.